Well, I want to talk a, a lot about the uh, eye injuries, and, and but first, before we get into that, I want to talk about something a little more, uh, I guess, more in the news these days. And it's not really an eye injury; it's a brain injury. But we uh, we hear a lot about it, and, and you guys are on the sidelines, so I thought maybe some concussion stuff might be appropriate here. It's so common, I guess. Growing up playing playing ball, playing football and baseball and, and things like that, you never, I, I mean, I never heard about it in, in high school. Uh, but it's so common. About 62,000 are reported uh, yearly. Uh, that's a 15 to 20 percent chance for every year that a kid plays. So it's, it's really, you know, it's really out there. The long-term sequela, that's what we're hearing about on ESPN every night, you know, and, and all the lawsuits that are, that are stemming from all that. And this, you know, this can be more than just, you know, memory loss and, and headaches. I mean, there are, you know, a second impact syndrome that can even do somebody in. So this is a, a serious issue. I guess, oh, I can't really see that as well as I thought. But uh, the concussions, not just in football, even though we do tend to think of them primarily in football. And here I was, oh, you, again, you can't really see it as well. You can't think this... Uh, this says Goodell on the back of, of that jersey right there. Yeah. But um, when you're doing a, a, when someone gets, you know, a, a, I guess a, a hard hit and you're worried about a concussion, the problem with testing on the sideline or, or immediate testing is that some of these symptoms don't show up right away. I mean, some of these things are going to take 45 minutes or an hour, hour and a half to really come through. I mean, you're going to check your, your neurologic exam. You're going to check, you know, uh, you know, where are you? Are they alert and oriented? Their cognition? But there are some other things with the eyes in particular that you can do that may help us. Some of them are, I think, on the forefront that may, well, there'll probably be a push for some of this to become more standardized and more standard of care with their yearly physical. But uh, let's look at some of the things that we can test for. Pupils is a, uh, is a, big, uh, a big indicator, and that's what we used to always look at. You've all seen that before. When you shine a, a direct light in the eye, the pupil will constrict. You swing it to the other side and that pupil will constrict and you can go back and forth. In a concussion, you see a, a, a minimally responsive pupil. The pupil will stay, not, maybe not fully dilated, but it'll stay kind of mid-dilated and it won't really react too well to the light. It's a good test and if they have that, you know something's going on. But again, that usually doesn't show up right away. So you don't, you want to, you're trying to make the decision to put the kid back in the game or, or to hold him out that may not give you the best input right away. Um, another thing you can look for is eye motility. Um, you look for the six positions here. You have them look, you know, basically in, out, down and in, down and out, up and in, up and out. And you're looking for conjugation of the eyes. They should move together and there shouldn't be any uh, double vision. The kids shouldn't see anything like that. You can kind of see on, on this uh, especially down here, you see how one eye is looking down and one eye is not. Okay, that's kind of what the difference is that we're looking for. They look pretty good most everywhere else, but uh, it may not be, this is kind of hard to see, this is the best example I could see, but you, you would probably see it even more pronounced than that if they're not, if they're not really with it. They're not, just, they're not gonna be able to do this test very well. That's another clue. Again, not something that's gonna be immediately present though. Um, Psychotic movement is the rapid eye movements of the eye. That's something that will be immediately relevant. Now, the, the hard part is, though, it's hard to test that. So this guy, or these guys uh, with the King-Devick test, they have come up with a method that will help you uh, score uh, an athlete immediately after an injury to determine if they've had a concussion or, or if there's any slowed response uh, neurologically. So what you do with the test is it's just a sheet of numbers and you ask them to read the numbers, and as they do, their eyes have to jump. That's the psychotic movement. So they jump from letter or number to number. And you just kind of, you time them. That's where I think this may be more of an issue going forward if we had, if this was a part of the standard, you know, uh, yearly physical test where they had to do this test and they were timed, so you get some kind of a baseline. That's why this isn't really mainstream right now because you can't just give, give a kid a card on the sideline and see what, you know, if it's slowed or not. There's not. It may be slowed compared to some, but is it slowed compared to what their baseline is? But the psychotic movement would be slowed right away from an injury if they had an injury right away. You could check this on the sideline. So if you had them before, when they were, before an injury and they were 15 seconds and they were down to 20, you would know not to put that kid back in the, in the game. 
So that's, you know, something I think will be coming around more uh, as concussions now are definitely on the forefront and we're, we're talking about them or we hear about them every day. I think this will something that will trickle down to all levels of sports. Now we'll go into the uh, regular old eye trauma. You'll see lots of things on the, on the, on the field, I guess. Most of them are, are very minor injuries for the eye. Abrasions, which is just a scratch on the cornea. Uh, a subconjunctival hemorrhage, which is, it looks terrible, but that's usually just nothing, just a bruise. Um, and then on down into bigger things. We see more orbital fractures uh, than any of these, these other, uh, other uh, major injuries. But uh, orbital fracture in itself can be a pretty major thing, although not usually. Usually it's something you just have to let heal. Uh, but retinal detachments, that's a vision-threatening injury, uh, certainly something you want, you want to be aware of and catch. Um, with a retinal detachment, the patients would see a, a, a kind of a, a film or a veil, a curtain almost, pull over just a, a quadrant or half their vision. It wouldn't, things don't just go dark, but they would, after a, a trauma, they would see a, 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 just a, a veil that's it's kind of opaque, whereas... You know, if it was something they could see, uh, something in their vision, like a floater, they would be able to see beyond it as well. But if it was a true retinal detachment, they would see a veil and it would be dark. They wouldn't be able to see beyond that. They may see fine over here, but this spot where the veil is, that would be something you'd want to you'd get that looked into pretty quickly. Uh, vitreous hemorrhage is the same way. It's uh, just a pop blood vessel on the inside of the eye, and that'll fill the eye with blood. It'll be dark. Uh, they may see a red tint to everything, but they won't be able to see. That's the, the good thing about these. There is a visual component, so it will be obvious if, you, if, the, if the kid is uh, checked. Uh, and of course, a ruptured globe, that's the, the, the biggest eye trauma of all if the eyes is uh, damaged. That's, uh, you know, that's something that's going to look pretty obvious. It looks you know, really bad. You know something's going on there. There'll be, um, the eye will be deflated or there'll be uh, uh, orbital contents kind of protruding out of the, out of the, the globe. And with that, if you ever have an injury where you're concerned it may be something serious like that, you, you just want to grab something like a cup and just tape it over the eye so that they can't touch it or push on it or rub it and then get them to the emergency room. So that would be something you could do you know, on the sideline just uh, if you were ever worried about something as serious as one of these. But let's talk a little more about, about some of the other more minor injuries. Um, an abrasion, again, is just a, a, a scrape uh, of the outermost uh, covering of the eye, the epithelium. And um, it's going to look really red, but it's not going to look like this. This is the subconjunctival hemorrhage. This guy is not going to have any problems with his vision, and there's really no threat to his vision with something like this. It's just a pop blood vessel, just a bruise, a hematoma. It would look purple under the skin, but it looks bright red and real scary, you know, when you're looking at him. Now, the abrasion is something that they're going to need some treatment for. Um, they're going to have blurry vision, and they're going to have a lot more pain. This guy may not even have any pain. But this sort of, this sort of picture here, um, it's, it's going to be something that needs, needs addressing with an eye doctor pretty quickly. So with an orbital fracture, which there have been several you know, professional players. I think uh, uh, one, uh, James Harrison may have had one last season with the Steelers. Uh, I think this is Burnett. He got one from a baseball injury. But this does happen. You know, uh, basically, you're going to have a lot of swelling. Uh, you probably they're going to have double vision at first, real blurry vision because of the swelling. The, the orbit is designed to fracture, though. It's kind of a shock absorber. There's, a, 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 I guess, a cone of paper-thin bones around the eye. And on the inside of, or I guess, between the bones and the eye, there is fat. And on the outside of the bones, there's fat. So it's like a cushion. So the bones are designed to break so that it doesn't damage the eye. So it's very common, and most of these don't require any surgical intervention. They just require time to heal. Uh, but when you have a, a fracture of those bones, the muscles also run around there. So the, the muscles will be swollen, and the, they won't work right, and you'll probably see double. So that's a, a big indicator for one of these. Uh, but they are pretty obvious. I mean, usually, you know, I guess it could look like just a black eye, and you're kind of wondering if anything else is going on. Then, uh, but usually with a, it's just a, a regular hematoma of the eye, you're going to see... I guess full motions and no double vision, but if it's something more involved with a, a broken orbital bone, they probably will have more swelling, not just, a, uh, not just like a, an ecchymosis or, or a, a black eye. It'll be something more pronounced and, and almost swollen shut. Most of the time, within the first two days, you get a lot of swelling that actually closes the eye. They have a hard time even opening it to see. Um, but if you have something like that, of course, 
you want them to come in to see us, you can put ice on it, and, and, but try and raise the lid and make sure they can see. If it's something where it's swollen like this and then you, you raise the lid and they still can't see and can't even see light, that's an emergency. You want to get them in right away. If they can still see okay under that, it's still something we need to see, but you don't necessarily have to come in, you know, in the middle of the night for that. But orbital fractures are pretty common. Any kind of direct blow is, is going to pop one of those bones, but usually require no intervention unless the uh, motility of the eye, unless the muscle gets into the fracture and it kind of pinches off the muscle, we have to go in and, and free that, all that up. But there is some protective eyewear, and, and with a lot of these injuries, we can get the players back on before, you know, not all of them require a six-week healing time. Abrasions are probably the, the number one thing that we uh, see from sports-related injuries, and everybody wants to go back out there. It's not really, you know, you can't really make it worse as long as you protect it. So the shields are really good, and, of course, the, the helmets now for baseball that, that will prevent the ball from actually getting through there is one thing. Of course, in the field is another story. So the protective eyewear, I, I, I recommend a lot, and I think uh, they probably have some that look a little better than those, but you want to have some kind of shatterproof lens, some kind of polycarbonate lens, and that's uh, not just for, for kids who've had an eye injury. We recommend that for anybody who's had, uh, who has poor vision on one side. If you have to protect their good eye, you're going to want to wear something, even if the other eye is perfectly healthy. You don't want to have an injury to your only good eye. So I don't think enough kids wear the protective eyewear for things like basketball or baseball, uh, even though they should, because the status of their other eye is probably, probably not considered very much. And wearing glasses playing sports is, is very awkward. Um, but contact lenses are, are great for vision, but they don't protect the eye. So I, I do think, I think more people should wear the protective eyewear. There are lots of options with that, and if you guys have, uh, I guess if you have any questions or anything, I'd be happy to answer them.